My name is Margot Rollins, and I am your Zoom host for today and a program coordinator at Sonoma State University's Center for Environmental Inquiry, and welcome to Camera Traps and Research and Management. My colleague at the center, Ben Bravo, will lead today's program, and he will introduce the other experts on his team once he takes over the camera. Our public events are usually done at either our Galbraith Preserve in Mendocino County or the Osborne Preserve on Sonoma Mountain and Pengrove. And although we're feeling the sh challenges of this shelter-in-place time, like all of you are, no doubt, we're really glad to be able to reach people during this time and connect in new ways. We usually pass around a sign-in sheet, but that isn't going to work so well this time. So in lieu of that, would everyone please just take a moment to type their full name into the chat box? I don't want the whole, if you don't want the whole group to see it, you can just send it to me instead of to everyone, to me, Margo, instead of to everybody. You are all muted, and I believe all of you have your um, videos off as well. We may turn that on toward the end in the question and answer period, but at this point, you're all off. If you need to, to get in touch with us, if you need to tell us that something's wrong, uh, please raise your hand if you can see that function at the bottom of your screen and put in the chat what, what the problem is and I will uh, try to address it. Before I let Ben take it away, I just want to give you a, a few words about the Center for Environmental Inquiry and how we can be a resource to you, no matter if you're affiliated with the University of Sonoma State or not. Or, uh, there are things that, things that we do that can involve you. The Center basically envisions a North Bay working together to find sustainable solutions and invites you to get environmentally ready with us. We're building a community of learners and problem solvers across all sectors of society by providing firsthand understanding of all of our connectivity with the natural world. We also provide skill building experiences that result in sustainable solutions. Today's program will do that, will help build your skills in working with animals you can't necessarily see. There are many ways to get involved, engage in research, work with iNaturalist land management training programs, uh, internships, student jobs, and attending events like this, access the data on our website, and lead or contribute to events such as this. So today we're going to focus on camera traps and how they can greatly affect our understanding of and our connectivity to nature. This event has a very simple format. Ben and his co-presenters will talk for about 45 minutes, and then we'll have 10 to 15 minutes for questions. If you want to email me after the event for any follow-up, if you have questions that didn't get answered or you just have comments you want to make, I will make sure that you have access to my email. So I, again, I've muted you all. So turn off your, raise your hands if you need anything. And when we get to the question and answer period that Ben will manage, use the chat function to ask your questions, and hopefully we can get through everybody's questions before we're, we're over. So Ben, it's take it away. You've got the screen. Share my screen. Can you all see my screen? Does look good? Yes. All right. So hello, my name is Benjamin Bravo. I'm the Preserve Resource Manager for Sonoma State University Center for Environmental Inquiry. With me, we have uh, Dr. Chris Hall, who is a nature tech program developer um, for the Center for Environmental Inquiry. And we also have Stephen Hammerich, who is the wildlife specialist for Pepperwood. I will dive a little bit more into each of the introductions right before they speak, um, but I just want to get started with what we have today. Uh, here is our, oops, sorry. Here is our contact information in case you would like to talk to us more in the future. Oops, sorry. All right, so today we will talk about wildlife camera traps and research and management. So we're gonna have kind of a, a different menu of different wildlife camera projects in this area, focusing on Osborne and a little bit on Galbraith, and then we will have Stephen talk about Pepperwood. So I'll be talking for the first 10 minutes to give kind of an introduction. Chris will do the, the middle section. I'll have a little bit of graphs and data from the Osborne and Galbraith, Galbraith projects, and then we'll have Stephen for the last part. So a little bit about me. I've used camera traps for about the past five years or so, uh, starting first with my undergraduate research on wood rat activity patterns. You can see here in the, the left. Um, 
I use camera traps as well for my master's work, uh, focusing a little bit more on education and citizen science with camera traps. And I use camera traps, um, or I was part of volunteer efforts at Stanford's uh, Jasper Ridge Preserve and other online projects. Uh, more recently, I've been using these, these stealth cams in my backyard to see uh, where the raccoons are and if I can change things around so I don't have raccoons waking me up at night when they're uh, rummaging through. So that's kind of that. And so why are we talking about camera traps? Why are these important? So there's a lot of different sensor networks to study things like um, earthquakes, to study the weather, to study vegetation changes, but there's not really a great way to study biodiversity rapidly and all over the world. So camera traps are kind of one of the methods that might eventually um, be used for that. And they're currently used all over the world and there's a possibility to connect them to other networks and help um, more rapidly assess biodiversity. Uh, this is a really big, um, or there's a really big need for this because uh, species are going extinct. There's so much change that happens pretty rapidly and we need ways to study that. So camera traps, they use um, an infrared sensor to detect the movement of heated objects. On the diagram on the left, you can see a deer setting off the, the camera. And once the infrared uh, sensor is triggered, they take a photo or a video. Uh, and there's a lot more about the settings that we're not going to get into today. Um, on the right, camera traps actually have a, a field of view. So they're really only a small slice of the, um, of the habitat. Uh, Someone have their microphone on? I keep hearing background noise or other extra background noise. Uh, so camera traps were kind of first created in the early 1900s by a, uh, I think he was an enthusiast. I don't think he was exactly a wildlife ecologist named Shearus. That was his last name. And he had a, a tripwire and that caused the cameras to, to take photos. And I think he even had flashes and he did some really early wildlife photography at night. So that was, is really interesting uh, professor. Then fast forward, maybe about the 90s, uh, 1980s to 2000s, camera traps kind of had a resurgence and they were used more for by ecologists for research. And um, this example here has two Stanford uh, graduate students using camera traps, uh, kind of like a homemade device and they use infrared beams that would, would go across and kind of function in the same way as a trip wire. When an animal would walk by, they would take a photo. Um, and these were actually set up like in a pair. So that's that time period. And then more recently, camera traps have been made into these integrated, uh, very inexpensive devices that, that the general public can buy and, and uh, researchers buy these as well and set them up um, in large numbers. And so camera trap is not only used for research. Uh, if you're using it for research, people tend to use it for population structure, habitat use, behavior but it's also can be used for management. So I've been part of projects where they use it to see how effective their restoration is. Are there improvements they could be making? It's kind of just a good, uh, good proof that all the hard restoration work, all the time spent um, you know, removing invasive plants is producing more wildlife. So that was kind of nice to see. You can also use it to see kind of human impacts. Maybe there's trails that are being overused, things like that. Um, you can use it for education, so showing videos to the public, showing photos to the public definitely gets people interested. You can kind of show them uh, different examples of when the animals are active, uh, what kind of behaviors they have, so definitely a really fun tool for that. And then you can use them for security, uh, so kind of like trespassing um, in other preserves. Sometimes people use them for, to, to detect poachers, but that's not really what we use them for. Um, and so the methods you use kind of match what you want to use the cameras for. So uh, if you're using it for, if you want kind of an even spread of your habitat, you can use a, a grid. Um, this is one TAMS uh, in Marin County. Uh, they have cameras on an even grid as, as well as I believe uh, Pepperwood has them on an even grid as well, but I'll let Stephen talk more about that. Um, Jasper Ridge uses a slightly different method. They use, uh, they have camera traps set up along certain trail intersections <clears throat> and there's other papers where people set them up on lakes and rivers and near human structures and then there's even uh, this is really more of an other category so I just call it special interest but really everything else there's so much variety of use you have uh, some researchers who set them up 
uh, facing bird nests up in the trees or studying arboreal um, primates. So there, there's a, a wide variety of uses. Um, and there's also a wide variety of outputs. So if you have, if you've done an ecology study, maybe you want to study the, um, the visitations, the occupancy of certain sites. This is kind of a spatial use. This picture is from Rovero 2014. Um, you can study the activity patterns. This is a really fun graph called an overlap plot where you can see their activity. And you can even do, um, you can even look at the overlap between prey and predator or the same species in different sites. So that's a really fun uh, output from that. You can study the, the populations. This one should really have an asterisk next to it because this is pretty difficult to do uh, correctly. There's a lot of lot more mathematical assumptions that go into doing this. And in this example, this was Karen's 1995, where they, um, this was one of the first papers to really do this, where they studied individual stripes, or sorry, individual tigers, and they could kind of separate them out by their stripe patterns. And so they were able to kind of get an understanding of the population. Um, but this is very tricky, and you usually have to combine it with other methods. Um, in California, they have collared mountain lions, and when you have a collared mountain lion and it's hooked up to a, a GPS unit, or you can track the, the GPS movement of it, you can tell when that animal goes in front of your camera, and you can use some mathematical models to estimate the overall population. But that's a very tricky thing to do, very difficult. And then lastly, you can also study behavior. So this is a little more, it's a little different from the other three categories, and this one, uh, is kind of like ethology, uh, uh, a branch of, of ecology where you're studying the specific behavior, a specific window of, of the animal's life. Um, oftentimes this is done in a lab, but with camera traps, you get the opportunity to study the animal's behavior out in the field. You can see, you can focus on specific behaviors. So here, this is actually from Galbraith. We have a pig rub site where we can look at the, the pig rub or the um, tree rubbing behavior of, of wild pigs. And this is just a kind of a summary diagram. I'm not going to actually go into this. Um, now we'll have uh, Dr. Chris, I'm sorry, Dr. Chris Hall talk. Uh, Dr. Chris Hall is a, has over 30 years of experience analyzing data, large data sets, and he's the current right of way principal investigator um, and the nature tech program development lead. So I'll let Chris, uh, I'll stop sharing. I'll let Chris share his slides. Okay, let's see how this, whoops, the meeting just disappeared. Oh, okay. Let me see if I can. Um, yeah, I'm not being allowed to share my screen, actually. It's been disabled. So. Try again, oh. Chris. Try again. Uh, there we go. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Is that coming across? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So I've been then. You need to go in presentation and, mode. I'm sorry. You. We can. You need to do put it in presentation mode. Uh, it is. Okay. I think you should be able to see the whole slide now. Now, now we can. Oh, okay, cool. Okay, so yeah, I've been doing this for about 30 years all over the world with different data sets and mostly oceanography and engineering. Um, and like Ben said, you know, we work at the Center for Environmental Inquiry. And our role is really to link students and faculty with real environmental problems. Um, sometimes it's as simple as just making a connection. And sometimes as in this project, uh, we actually have to step up and be the PI and derive it if we don't have an exact faculty match. And the idea is that simply research in a classroom is not enough. We have to help with things. And so this project is really and these cameras that we're talking about are really part of a tree fund project. And the idea is we have three sites, uh, one being Fairfield Osborne Preserve near the coast, 
And the farthest one away on this map is El Dorado National Forest up near Lake Tahoe. And so we're really looking at clearing the vegetation underneath the power line and then studying how that affects animal movement. Um, and the reason for clearing the vegetation, as we all know, is because nobody wants wildfires. So it's something that has to be done. In terms of the Osborne and clearing the vegetation, we have a number of studies. Uh, for example, we look at how the changing vegetation affects pollinators. Uh, we have studies looking at sudden oak death on the preserve. We look at how the changing vegetation affects microclimate. But in terms of the presentation today, we're going to talk a little bit about animal movement and image analysis. And so rather than focus on what animals we see, we want to focus on one big issue with wildlife cameras. And that is false alarms. So you put out a camera and plants grow or branches fall down in front of a camera and the branch will wiggle and wiggle and wiggle and you can get thousands of false alarms um, for every am animal image that you get. And that's a problem because you have to look through all these, all these cameras. You know, another, another thing that happens in some of our cameras is you get shadows moving across the ground and that triggers the camera to take pictures because it, it's a heat source that's moving and so the camera is going to take a lot of snapshots. And false alarms can cost hundreds of hours in personnel time because you're actually going through the cameras trying to find an animal that's not there. So I teamed up with a professor in computer science and, and we developed a simple guided class project, quote unquote simple. And we decided to use Google TensorFlow because it's one of the artificial intelligence methods that's behind all of these other, other fancy facial recognition and driverless cars and all that kind of stuff. Um, a lot of those use Google TensorFlow, so it's very appropriate for students to learn. And the idea behind it is you take a picture like this mountain lion, and after you develop your model, you feed it, you know, you feed it through this Google TensorFlow model that you've developed, which in itself is an art and a science and takes a long time. We're kind of skipping over that part. And then the model returns you, returns what is a classification of the animal, right? So in this case, for example, the model might say this is a mountain lion and I'm 95% certain that it's a mountain lion. And so if you decide that 95% certainty is good enough, then you will say it's a mountain lion. The problem with the system, I mean, it's very, very powerful. The problem with the system is it's a black box. So you don't actually know what features of the mountain lion Google TensorFlow is keying on. Is it keying on the ears? Is it keying on the paw? Is it keying on a little bit of a tail? And so if you get another image that's slightly different, the model may or may not be able to, to extract the relevant information and give you a correct classification. So it's very powerful and it's also very scary because you don't know why it's picking things. And we'll talk and we'll see what happens um, with that. So here's an example. Um, we're looking for false alarms in a bunch of images. And so our model might say, hey, I think this is a false alarm, and I'm about 60% certain it's a false alarm. And if you look closer, you see this little gray streak. And this little gray streak, I've tried to pull it out over here. There's actually a squirrel in this picture. So even though the computer model is saying it's a false alarm, it is not. But if you say, well, Anything over 50%, let's just say it's a false alarm. Let's just use that as our cutoff. So here's a 60% cutoff. It's above 50%. We're going to call this a false alarm. What happens if we do that with all the photos in our database? And my screen is frozen. Whoops.
Sorry. My screen is a little bit uh, decided to die here. Oh, there we go. Um, so if we say, you know, anything over 50% likelihood is a false alarm, you can see that we capture 90% of false alarms, right? That's what this table is showing. So of the false alarms, 90% of them we correctly identify. We have a problem, right? Because We've also said that 80% of the vehicles that drove on the fire road, we're calling those false alarms too. And then roughly 15% of the squirrels, which are images like this, we're calling false alarms. So the squirrels are misclassified, some of them. But we get most of the false alarms, so that's pretty good, which is what our goal was. Now, if we take the same, same exact picture, you know, the, the model says we're 60% certain this is a false alarm, but we change the threshold. We say you have to actually be 95% certain, right, to call that a false alarm. So this is only 60%. So we're going to say no. We're going to say this is not a false alarm. Then what happens? Well, we don't, we get hardly any squirrels that are misclassified now, right? This is not going to be a false alarm because we're not 95% certain. But what we've done is we've actually only captured 50% of the false alarms. So there's 50% of the false alarms we actually think have something in them because we need 95% certainty. So it's a different model, right? So fewer than 1% of the squirrels are misclassified, but we're only getting 50% of the false alarms. So this is the same same bunch of images, but we've just changed our acceptable threshold. And so this is really at the heart of any image processing system. And that's what, the think, that's what you should think about when people talk about facial recognition for criminals or smart driving cars, is there's always a trade-off, right? And the, and the questions you, you ask are, is it important to identify almost all false alarms even though animals and vehicles are misclassified? Or is it more important to avoid misclassifying animals as false alarms? And the answer to that question will depend on the goal of your system, right? So if you've got a real-time system taking pictures and you want to send pictures live to people of animals on your preserve, you don't want to send false alarms. So in that case, you want to identify all the false alarms and get rid of them. So you're going to use the first one. But if you're doing research and you want to classify things correctly, it's probably more important not to include animals in your false alarm thing. So you're going to actually choose the second one, right? You're only going to get some of the false alarms, and then people are going to have to go and spend hundreds of hours weeding out the rest. So there's two types of systems you can imagine designing. And that's really the, the point, is that this is complicated, and there's no one right answer for everything. Um, general comment, because of because uh, TensorFlow and, and, and image identification systems work on common animals really well, common events, deer, squirrels, stuff like that. If you have rare animals, this is probably not something you're going to do. And that's also a point about driving, is driving is a series of rare events. And that's what makes artificial intelligence and smart, smart cars so, so difficult. Um, so anyway, that's my bit. I guess I'm going to turn it over to Ben and turn it back over to Steve. So I'm just going to switch screens really quick. Uh, so thank you uh, very much, uh, Chris, uh, for giving us a lot more information about the Osborne Camera Trap project and some of the AI work that you've been doing with them, or you've been leading for the past five years. Um, I'm just going to show some. Oh, uh, I think Chris, you need to stop your screen. 
Oh, okay. There we go. Um, so really quick, wouldn't be a camera chat presentation if we didn't show some videos. So here's uh, some fun videos from Osborne. I actually have the sound off for this one because the sound was kind of jarring in practice versions. But this is just a quick visual tour of the different camera. Right. Uh, different camera traps. Um, so, quick note: all of these camera traps photos were labeled by undergraduate students. Uh, these are from 2015 and 16. So, they, if you uh, remember, Chris talking about all the hundreds of hours of work. This is uh, kind of the output of some of that. Um, <clears throat> and data that I will be showing, or some graphs I'll be showing in a few minutes, is also from all the hard work of Chris and all the undergraduates who, who put a lot of time into setting everything up and maintaining everything. Yeah, there was there was music in the background, but it, yeah, it was <laughs> a little too much. Um, and um, this video is organized by location, so um, you can kind of see how these different animals look in different sites. This is our sudden oak death camera or sod camera for short. Um, and you'll see a lot of deer and a lot of squirrels <laughs> at pretty much every site. And daytime, daytime possum, which is not as common. But Northern Tower Meadow camera, again, still more deer. Um, these aren't entirely representative of the, the proportion of, of, uh, of wildlife that were there. Uh, if it was, you would see it would just be a slideshow of pretty much all deer and, and squirrels. If it was more proportional, then you'd have a lot of grass photos. But um, this is a, a sampling of some of the more fun photos. And as you may have noticed, since these are on a triple shot setting, you can have you can do some fun things with, with movement. It looks like they're moving around, but really this is just each photo kind of the time compressed and then just put to get strung together in a video software. So you, you do get movement. And if you're, if you spend time looking at camera trap photos as a volunteer, as a researcher, you'll actually notice that the ears, you can see the ears wiggle. You can see the body kind of compress as the animal's breathing. If you have a camera trap that's taking a triple shot. This is, I think, a few seconds. Yeah, right there. <laughs> right there, you can see the deer kind of moving or breathing, which is, I think, fascinating and really get that nice kind of personal connection to the animal. Just see them breathing and moving and, and just kind of walking around. Uh, one of the definitely one of the reasons why I love camera traps and why I'm I'm happy to have this short video in the middle of of the presentation. Let's see, okay. Thank you for watching. There was music that went with this. Please look at our YouTube channel to see the one with music. It's kind of fun, like classical. Oh, Bob raised his hand. Um, sorry. Okay, I think everything's, hopefully everything's fine. Uh, share screen. Go back. And uh, we'll have a quick, let's see. Really quickly, I just want to show you some of the outputs outcomes of some of the 2015-2016 uh, classifications. So again, kind of, uh, these are graphs that I made from looking at the classification student made made um, and put into a spreadsheet and then made some fun graphs. So just to give you an idea of what you can get with this information and um, let's see, present this. So this is, uh, let's see, a good example of activity pattern. So this is kind of a mess. This is a tangled mess of, of lines. And if this was a static graph, I would say, you know, this is, <laughs> don't publish this. This is just too much. But with this interactive graph, you can, um, and I'll share these, the link to these graphs with, with the audience or with you all later. Um, oops, sorry. So if you want to look at something like human, 
human and let's do human and deer and I'm going to keep only that. So this is just human and deer. I just selected those and you can see uh, the, the bottom is the, the hour. So 12 is noon. You can see, oh, there's, there's actually a peak of human activity right during the middle of the day, probably when we have all of our tours. And then you can see the deer, <laughs> the deer activity is like, is peaking outside of that time. So that's just kind of a fun pattern that I noticed from playing with these, um, kind of just by luck or just by fiddling around with the graphs and looking for patterns. I wouldn't necessarily try to say, oh, there's definitely a pattern, but this is something that people look at. They look at, or sorry, that researchers look at a lot is, are we having an effect on the animals? Um, there's definitely some research, I think it was Riley 2016 or 2017, where she looked at 100 different preserves or a lot, a lot of them, maybe 50 to 100 in the Bay Area, and you do see a shift with animals going from uh, a site that doesn't have people to a site that does have people. You see a shift in the activity pattern. So that's a question that's that's being looked at by a lot of research currently. Um, let me just unselect that to get this initial mess. And you can also do this with things like the the site. So this is. Instead of looking at the hour, this is looking at the, the calendar or the, the, the months. And again, kind of very hard to see, but let's say we just want to look at deer again and keep only the deer. You can see, oh, look at that. Oh, maybe there's a peak. Some of this peak could be just kind of by when they're visiting. You wouldn't necessarily want to say this is a population increase, um, especially with, with like how, how we set things up. Um, I also want to note, I should have said this earlier, these are visitations to the camera, not the number of photos. So I went through the data and you can you can um, remove all the, the same records if they're within half an hour, half an hour of each other. That's what I did. Um, other researchers do an hour. They may even do a 24 hour period. Um, and that's so you don't have a deer that's just roaming around in, in front of the camera and giving you a uh, less accurate count of the visitation. So this is deer visitations amongst all the sites. So you could just think of it as Osborne as a whole. And for some reason in mid-July, there were a lot more visitations and then uh, then they kind of decreased. But, um, and you can also play around with the, the number of visitations by site. So you can see, oh, there's a lot of human visitations at this site and there's some deer and then this one has a lot of deer and less humans. And I can try to make some very um, basic comparisons that way. Let me exit. So that was Osborne, and I'll make these hopefully available. I'm not gonna make changes. And we also have Galbraith. So I didn't talk too much about Galbraith because we're gonna talk a little bit more about it in a later presentation. But Galbraith, we had three cameras set up, and those are more of the behavior. They're on videos, they have a different focus, and they're looking at pigs. And so by looking at some of the videos, you can get you can do something a little more interesting let's do this so with videos this past fall <laughs> i looked at a lot of pigs looked at pigs in ways i don't want to again but had to look at a lot of pigs to see if it was male female um mixtures of like i couldn't tell because they were moving around too much um, they were in big groups sometimes 10 10 15 pigs so trying to stop the video and look at every pig was took a lot of time but I just want to uh, show you this so you can get kind of an idea of what other kinds of things you can do with camera traps. So if you are able to identify male, female, child, or adult, you can look at, are there peaks when, sorry, let me just, are there different peaks when there's more males or more females? It'd probably be a little more interesting if you were to look at when the youth peak, um, and this was kind of a quick overview. So of course, a researcher would do a much more thorough assessment. You can also look at are there certain hours where maybe you see a lot more male only groups or female only groups or mixtures of like maybe families of pigs. Um, and, and again, this is just a sample of what you could do with it. And uh, you would definitely, if you're looking at this, would want to keep only one at a time so you can look at it. Or you could maybe look at comparisons, um, like maybe, I don't know, maybe the male and female groups don't spend a lot of time around each other or something like that. Um, but again, that's something for, for people to play with. So this should be available. And that's just to give you an idea of, uh, not gonna save this, of what you can do um, with these graphs and, and how you can just learn a little bit more about when the animals are active, maybe what they're doing. Uh, 
Galbraith is definitely a very interesting system where um, <clears throat> we do have videos and we can ask uh, questions a little differently. So that is, that's all I have for this interlude. <laughs> um, but now we have Stephen Hammerich uh, from Pepperwood. Stephen Hammerich has lived in Sonoma County his whole life and he has been, um, has used camera traps for the past eight years. He was a, um, he attended Santa Rosa uh, Community College and that's how he first got introduced to Pepperwood. Um, Pepperwood's camera trap projects, and then he was a Sonoma State undergraduate. Um, so, uh, and currently he's the wildlife specialist at Pepperwood. So I'll let Stephen, um, on a personal note, I'm really excited to have Stephen here. Um, I am, Pepperwood has been kind of one of my camera trap role models uh, to some extent, and I've, I've heard about them for the past five years or so. So I'm, I'm really excited to have Stephen here and for you all to get that additional perspective on camera traps. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and let Stephen uh, talk. All right, good morning, everyone. Glad to be here. Uh, thank you, Benjamin, for asking me to join you for your workshop. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, uh, my path of education, uh, how I, uh, where I went to school, how I kind of got to Pepperwood, uh, and now I'll be, uh, then I'll be talking about what I actually do at Pepperwood with my wildlife picture index project. Here are some pictures of some uh, wildlife that we've seen at Pepperwood. So my educational path, uh, I graduated from Piner High School in 1982. Uh, so I'm dating myself a little bit here, uh, but I was in construction for about 20 years. Uh, and then got injured uh, and then found myself returning to uh, to school and I, I found myself at Santa Rosa Junior College in uh, the fall of 2007. I graduated uh, from Santa Rosa JC in 2013 with AS degrees in environmental conservation, watershed management, resource management, and natural sciences. Uh, and I stayed at Santa Rosa JC for another year to complete my lower division transfer. I transferred to Sonoma State University in 2014 as a junior, uh, and then I graduated in 2016 uh, with a BA in Environmental Studies, Conservation and Restoration Track 1 uh, Biology, and then I also received a minor in Biology. After completing my studies at Sonoma State, uh, I was still part-time at Pepperwood, so I returned uh, to Santa Rosa Junior College uh, and I completed the GIS program and I received my AS degree in geospatial technology. Uh, and at that, right, at, right after that is when I was hired uh, at Pepperwood. Uh, so I, I was part-time permanent at Pepperwood since 2013, uh, but I became full-time permanent uh, in 2017. So let's get started. Uh, uh, here's a picture uh, of a bear in Healdsburg. Uh, this is from uh, one of, one of our uh, research project sites, uh, it's Audubon Canyon Ranches Modini Preserve. Uh, and I really like this picture. It's actually my screensaver for my, for my computer, uh, but it just shows this older adult male uh, with a scarring and it just, it just really shows the resilience of wildlife. Uh, and and uh, in addition to that, I really like bears a lot. So I'm gonna show uh, another, a video here. This is a video my friend Richard took in Hillsburg. Uh, near that same study site, uh, and uh, it, it's so good I just had to show it. Up close and personal with a black bear, Sonoma County. Uh, that's pretty exciting. This is from his brownie camera, so as you can see, it takes pretty good video. <clears throat> Here's a juvenile black bear at Pepperwood. Um, probably getting pretty close uh, to dispersing age. Uh, this too is from the project, uh, the Wildlife Picture, Index Pro Wildlife Picture Index Project. I'm gonna describe a little bit later, um, but this is a camera that's actually in pretty close proximity to the target area. Uh, so this bear actually is, it fills the screen up pretty good. Here's an amazing picture of a mountain lion. Uh, this is from uh, the Modini uh, Pre Preserve Project site. Uh, this camera again is, it's kind of facing uh, in line with the trail. And so I get a, a, most of the pictures here, are either the animal coming at or going away from uh, the camera. Uh, and then uh, 
on that log you see there, we get a lot of uh, western fence lizards and mice and rats in, in nighttime pictures. So there's a lot of activity at this particular site. And now I'm gonna show you a picture of uh, what the, the black bear cubs do uh, to my cameras. So this is what I have to deal with pretty regularly whenever uh, we get some new cubs at the preserve. Uh, and, and if you missed that, I'll, I'm gonna show that again. Uh, but you can see that bear breaking that wooden stake off and putting my camera on the ground. I was, also, I was often wondering why my cameras kept ending, ending up on the ground. Uh, and so I set, uh, I set cameras up on video uh, over uh, my regular uh, still picture cameras. Uh, and, I, and I finally determined that it was the, bear, that was the bears causing me all the problems. <clears throat> Here's a nice daytime picture of a porcupine. Uh, this is actually a post tubs fire picture. Uh, prior to this, we had uh, some porcupine pictures, but they were only nighttime pictures. Uh, so they were black and white. Uh, we're really excited to, to finally get some daytime pictures of a porcupine. Uh, this is a picture of about a series of about five or six where the, the porcupine went one way and then turned around and went the other way. Uh, we're really excited to see that uh, this porcupine survived the tubs fire. Pretty remarkable. Here's just a little gallery of some of the uh, highlight photos uh, that I've gotten for my project. Uh, the raccoons on the bottom left and then the raccoon in the top center uh, are from Modini Preserve in Healdsburg. Uh, and the rest of them are from Pepperwood Preserve. Uh, with the exception of that badger in the bottom right hand corner, uh, I just pulled that off the internet. And uh, I mean, how can you not love that smile? I just had to post that picture. Here's some more pictures. Uh, these are nighttime pictures. Uh, as you can see, uh, I've spent a lot of time adjusting the flash intensity on my cameras and, and uh, to get really good pictures, uh, to make really good identifications. Uh, it's taken me eight years of just trial and error to really uh, fine tune our projects. The picture in the top center is actually kind of special. Uh, it's, it's a spotted skunk uh, and we don't see too many of those around, uh, but every once in a while we'll get a pretty good picture of a spotted skunk. Uh, it's really neat to detect them. Of course, we get lots of birds too. Uh, the picture on the top left is turkey vulture. Uh, seems to be posing for the camera. Uh, this is a, a picture of about a 50 picture series where this turkey vulture was doing all just, just different kinds of positions and moving around. Uh, and of course, uh, acorn woodpeckers on the right hand side. Uh, those are both from Modini Preserve uh, and a young uh, turkey on the bottom left. It's just kind of cute. And we get a lot of raven pictures. Uh, ravens seem to be really photogenic. Uh, the bottom one on the, the one on the bottom left seems to be doing a little dance with a piece of grass sticking out of its mouth. And uh, the picture on the bottom right uh, is a series of uh, many pictures of these these uh, ravens just kind of walking around. And then the picture above it it actually shows them when they take flight. Uh, so it's it's really amazing the pictures you can get with your cameras uh, if you just uh, wait for them to do their job. Here's a map uh, created by uh, uh, critical linkages of the Bay Area Open Space Council. Uh, this map is, is pretty old, uh, but what it shows is Sonoma County uh, and the areas in green are what they considered um, from their modeling to be core areas uh, where wildlife uh, would be able to reside uh, year round and have the resources they need without having to move around. Uh, and the lighter yellow uh, lines that you see in between these uh, core areas are what they considered to be corridor areas. These are areas where the land is still intact enough and hasn't had so much fragmentation uh, that it's still uh, possible for larger wildlife uh, to travel these paths and go from one core area to the next uh, to spread their genetics. Uh, as you can see, that little red dot you kind of see in the middle is Pepperwood Preserve. And we've kind of fallen on what they might think is, is a corridor area. And, you know, we're, we're kind of wondering about that. And uh, so part of our wildlife picture index project is actually uh, doing our ground truthing to see how really, how is pepperwood functioning? Uh, and kind of what we're seeing is that for the smaller wildlife, it's, it's certainly acting as a core area or a core area. Uh, and for the larger ones, uh, you know, the mountain lions and the pumas, uh, you know, they are going through there. And so it's kind of functioning as both, which is in a really unique, a really unique place on the landscape. Here's a map showing uh, Pepperwood's boundaries uh, in the green and then the yellow 
uh, our camera locations with letters and numbers identifying each particular site. Uh, as you can see, there's 20 on this particular grid, uh, and we're able to, uh, some of the cameras spill off onto our neighbor's property, uh, properties that adjoin Pepperwood, uh, and they were kind enough to let us set them up. Uh, so we're able to uh, get a really good representation of, of all of what's going around Pepperwood. Uh, we're in, uh, kind of set the grid up so that it's an equal vegetation uh, type. So we're in, we're in uh, forests, we're in oak woodlands, we're in uh, grasslands, uh, chaparral. So we've got a pretty good representation of all the different vegetation types at the preserve. This particular grid at Pepperwood, Pepperwood was set up in August of 2012. And here's a map that shows Pepperwood on the bottom, outlined in blue, and then Modini Preserve, uh, which is Audubon Canyon Ranch's preserve, uh, on the, the northern part of that map, which is outlined in red. Uh, so there's 20 cameras each at each preserve, um, and as you can see, Highway 128 kind of goes in between them, uh, which is considered to be a barrier. Most highways and freeways and larger roads are. Um, but I know that we're getting uh, animals going back and forth between the two preserves. Uh, in particular, I've observed uh, a mountain lion who I've named Notch because he has a big uh, chunk missing out of his ear. So it's, it's a really good indicator that that's that particular uh, individual. Uh, but I've seen that individual at Pepperwood and also I've seen that individual uh, at Modini. So I know that, uh, that that mountain lion, and he is a male, uh, he's, he was determined to be a male, is making that trip back and forth. and. Uh, so, so that, that brings up the question, like where is he going and, and, and how intact is that corridor that he's using? Uh, these are questions that Pepperwood wants to, uh, wants to ask these questions. We wanna find out uh, you know, how can we uh, protect this corridor area uh, in any way that we can or, or make, uh, uh, do some type of uh, preservation of it. So the wildlife picture index, I've been talking about this thing, this mysterious thing. Uh, well, it's an internationally recognized method. Uh, that was brought to uh, Pepperwood um, by uh, a, a wildlife ecologist. Her name was Sue Townsend. She was our PI on the project. Uh, and it has established protocols um, uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's used to detect biodiversity over time or changes in biodiversity over time. It's also consider, considered to be statistic, statistically robust uh, because of uh, the nature of camera data. It's, it's such huge data sets that your sample size is really, really big. And, and with that, you can, uh, you can achieve a higher confidence level. Uh, the citation on the bottom is O'Brien. Uh, and so if you wanna learn more about uh, the Wildlife Picture Index, this is a great paper uh, to, that'll share all the details with it. So this is what the data looks like after I've downloaded it onto the server. Uh, I, I batch name uh, the images with the date that I set it up, the date that I took it down, uh, year, month, day and then the camera location. Uh, you see a whiteboard, uh, that's that sign I put in the front uh, in the beginning of the data set. So uh, before I leave the camera, I'll flash the whiteboard. And before I, I come back, uh, when I retrieve the data, I'll flash the whiteboard. Um, and so it really, it really tightens up the data. I'll know that the camera was actually functioning properly with the date and time. Here's what it looks like when the, the images get cataloged. Uh, this is where uh, I have interns doing this. Uh, but they, they have a picture on one side and then an Excel spreadsheet on the other. Uh, and each uh, line on the Excel spreadsheet is, is, a, is an image of a picture. And they have to uh, include uh, the binomial or the genus and the species for each picture. Uh, and we heard earlier, this is very time consuming. Here's uh, uh, some of my past interns from, uh, from uh, the, the, the project. These are actually paid uh, Santa Rosa JC Mesa interns uh, are two of them, and then the other two are uh, recruits from projects that we've had at Pepperwood, which we call TNAT, which is a, a, a summertime camp thing. Um, and then when, I, when I'm still needing more students, I, I get some from the NRM, uh, NRM department at Santa Rosa JC, and I've even had a Sonoma State student that has uh, been part of our project, so it's been really exciting. So to sum up the workflow for Wildlife Picture Index, uh, the cameras are set up, you know, and after about six weeks, you can collect the data from the cameras. Uh, the data gets cataloged by the, by the, uh, the interns, gets analyzed by Morgan Gray, who's our uh, conservation an analyst with Pepperwood. Uh, through that, we, we get some uh, occupancy estimates, uh, and then also we'll be able to make season comparisons on those different objects. 
here's just a graph of, uh, of season one, results from season one analysis. Um, and, and this is what uh, you would, we would see um, across our entire project, like all the cameras, all 20 cameras, uh, broken down into one day periods, zero meaning none, and then one meaning 100%. So those are the percentages of what we would uh, expect to make detections on these particular animals. With all the different species. There's a picture uh, a couple of years old uh, of a sow with, um, with a cub and uh, I've, been, I've been able to, uh, fortunate to watch this cub grow up. Here's one of our black breads of pepperwood doing a little browsing in the chaparral area. As you can see, my, my camera was on the ground. He wasn't the one that knocked it down, but someone, another bear did. And here he is uh, taking a little bite on some vegetation. You know, bears are omnivores. And he's, he's not quite done with me yet. Uh, this next video is, is the bear uh, introducing himself to one of my cameras. Certainly up close and personal. And he's not done yet. All right. Well, that about concludes my presentation. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, and uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Well, Steve, before we have people jump in there, um, We've got about eight more minutes before this program is scheduled to end. I know Steve and Chris and Ben, are you willing to stick around a little bit if people want to ask questions and we run out of time? Absolutely. Chris and Ben, are you willing also? Sure. Sure. Okay, great. Uh, uh, yes. So if people, Ben's going to manage the questions. So if you would enter your questions into the chat box. So he can decide, you know, or or you can address whoever you think your question needs to go to, and we'll we'll take those and we'll we'll end at 11. And but people will stick around if your questions don't get answered. So uh, please let him put your questions in the chat box and let's see what we got. I just want to really quickly thank uh, Stephen and Chris uh, and Margot uh, for for being part of this presentation, and I'm really excited. Uh, just to see everyone, how different everything was and how um, hopefully all of you as um, as viewers and participants have kind of seen the wide variety of camera trap methods, what you can study with camera traps. And so I'm really happy that Chris and Steven gave not just the outputs, but also the behind the scenes look at how this is all set up, kind of the nitty gritty and uh, talking about the sheer number of hours you need to actually get these off the ground and moving. So, so I'm really happy we had that very complete um, uh, study of everything, or very complete view of everything. And oh, please ask uh, questions. Okay, so let's see. We have one from Edwin Spear to Steve. Are you using 16, 20, or 24 megapixel cameras? Uh, yeah, that's, that's a great question. <clears throat> um, it really kind of depends. Uh, I've been using eight megapixel for, for quite some time. Um, and uh, now that I'm using larger cards, I'm actually increasing the megapixel to reduce the amount of images uh, that can go onto a card. Uh, so, uh, you know, so if vegetation grows up or something, uh, the card will fill up at about 4,000 rather than 10,000. Ben, there's a question that came in. Um, does the same camera do infrared and normal light? This is from Bob Long. Um, in terms of uh, like the photos that it takes? I'm just reading the question. If Bob oh. wants to, uh, oh, okay. if he wants to, like, I can unmute him um, or he can unmute himself. Maybe. I can't seem to unmute Bob for some reason. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Uh, the, I'll jump in, I guess, at least our cameras. Yeah, in the daytime, you're getting a full visible light photo, and at nighttime, you're getting an infrared photo. Um, I'm not sure if that's what he's asking. 
Bob, you're unmuted now, so you can make sure this is what you wanted. Yes, I wanted to know if it was the same camera that uh, did a uh, normal daytime photo, and then I guess, depending upon the amount of light, it switches to infrared? Is that correct? Take it away, Ben. So yeah, the infrared, it's an infrared flash at night. Um, so low light conditions, it has a flash and then those are black and white. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any more? Any other questions? Oh. oh. Mm. Damage. So how often do cameras get damaged? What methods are taken to reduce potential damage, especially with bears? Have cameras been damaged with fires? This is probably definitely a question for both Stephen and, and Chris. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll chime in. Um, yeah, that's just kind of the nature of camera trapping. Uh, those are kind of sacrificial cameras because uh, they're really, I mean, you can put them in security boxes uh, and that'll, that'll help them some. Um, but they're, uh, you, it's really hard to protect them entirely because they are somewhat fragile. Uh, and so uh, we just keep extra cameras around. And uh, whenever I visit a site, I have an extra camera and equipment and uh, if something's damaged, I just replace it and uh, move forward. Yeah, and I think um, the other thing we've had happen too is that there are paranoid people about <laughs> that um, don't always like cameras. And so I think the, the metal protective boxes help a lot, but we've actually had people go and block the cameras on the preserve because they don't want to be filmed walking by a camera. So um, for us anyway, humans are often more problematic than animals. And um, another quick note is the, um, oh, sorry. Um, the, again, the cameras are not terribly expensive and Sometimes you see researchers using like a $100, $150 Bushnell, which is pretty decent, instead of buying like a, you can buy one really expensive camera that might get smashed, or you can buy a, a network of cameras that are less expensive, which is kind of a, a pretty common approach. And even the less expensive ones work really well still. Bushnell is, is awesome. So um, I don't, Chris or, or um, Steven, were any cameras damaged by fires? And I wasn't here when those <clears throat> fires happened. Um, yeah, I actually, um, Pepperwood, uh, burned in both the Tubbs fire and the Kincaid fire. Uh, and, uh, as, um, and then, uh, Modini burned, uh, in the Kincaid fire. Uh, and so I've, I've lost, yes, uh, lots of cameras to, to fire damage. Uh, fortunately, some of them melted up and I was able to save the SD card out of them. Um, but for the most part, uh, the Tubbs fire, I probably lost half my cameras, uh, and then the Kincaid fire. Uh, I, I lost more because I lost cameras on, on both projects, both Pepperwood and Moody. Yeah, and we didn't, we were fortunate enough not to burn at the preserve. We have a question from Julie. What is camera data used? What is the camera data used for? How is it shared within the county and beyond? Hmm. Hmm. Um, I'll start and then, and then Steve can take over because our data is used differently, I think. Uh, ours is mainly used to train students, uh, to get students on the preserve, to look at little questions. So for example, uh, we had a freshman class that we gave a camera project to and asked them to look at animal flux before and after one of the flyers, right? So as the animals ran away from one of the big fires using the trails of the preserve, we wanted to see if and when they came back, did they come back the same way? And so it's really used to engage students and faculty that way, um, or to engage them in this sort of artificial intelligence project that I set up. Uh, we haven't shared it with the county and beyond yet. That's sort of what, you know, Ben has been taking over and helping to classify that and get that out there. I know there's other systems, especially at Pepperwood, where it is put into database and shared with other people. And so I should let Steve take over and talk a bit about that. 
All right. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. Um, yeah. I wish Morgan no, Gray was. I wish Morgan Gray was was here with us because she's our, uh, our analysis. Uh, but uh, there's a couple of different um, places that the data is useful. It's useful right here on the preserve because uh, we can look at how we're managing the land. Uh, we we uh, we graze cattle here, um, and so we want to know how that's impacting the wildlife. And because our project's a long-term study, uh, we're just now just about done collecting our eighth year of data. Our first year of data basically set a baseline for what uh, detections we had on the preserve. And as the years pass, we can make comparisons to that. Uh, fortunately, we have Modini Preserve, which is about six miles north of us. And uh, Morgan's really been looking at um, climate change and uh, animal movement and, and the, the, the cost benefit that wildlife can, can achieve um, the temperature benefit by moving to a different area, whether it be more north or higher in elevation. Uh, and so those are things that, that are, can be looked at. Uh, certainly corridors are a really uh, important part of wildlife. And if, if we can determine uh, that there's a corridor somewhere that's, that's vital to um, say mountain lions or bears, that information can certainly be passed on to uh, uh, Ag and, Summit County Ag and Open Space District. Uh, and, and they can do what they can to get an easement on that property or, or purchase that property outright, outright uh, as, as well can the, the land trust in our area. Uh, so it, it helps to target uh, lands that are, that are um, uh, potentially, uh, potentially to be preserved. And, and one thing I should, I forgot, I should be remiss in saying is that our studies have been funded by PG&E and the Tree Fund. And this is part of really a national network of right of way research. And so we do go to um, various local and national conferences and share what we're finding about animal movement through these rights of ways with, with national organizations and um, rule makers. Well, thank you all. It's, uh, we're, we're a little bit past our time. And I, Ben, you probably had a few things you wanted to say as wrap up, but I just wanted to. Thank everybody for coming. Uh, we, we will stay around a few more minutes, and I hope you've learned a lot and you feel empowered to use these skills that, that you learned about how to use camera traps. Uh, ben, why not, I, I do have a few more things that I want to say, so if, if you don't mind, before people start drifting off, this is just one of the series that we're doing at Sonoma State on um, our environmental issues. and. This is the 11th, and we have a couple of dozen, and we have so we have another dozen or so coming up in the next couple of months, going through June. Uh, we've got one on climate change and personal action. There are two that actually that Chris is doing. Chris Holly, who was with us today, one on climate change and personal action, and another on waves, sound, and bird sampling. And I've heard a lot of that second one, and it's an excellent program. Ben is going to be doing another camera trap program, which is a little bit more focused on the consumer, as it were, on the general public's use, and uh, uh, be, be talking about what kind, different kind of cameras there are, how to place them, and depending on what you are trying to find out from them. And that program is on May 16th. And in order to find out what our upcoming programs are, you need to go to cei.sonoma.edu count slash calendar, and that will take you to our, our list of upcoming events. So I hope you all are staying safe. And we will, by the way, we are. We did record this program, and we will be trying to get it up within the next couple of weeks, if possible. So you can come back again to cei.sonoma.edu/calendar, and you can look at past events and look at this recording to review the things that that we, you heard today. So Ben, I'm sorry. I know you have other things you wanted to mention too. Oh. Um, yeah, that, that's all I had for uh, like the more um, kind of my end of the presentation. I just noticed there were more questions, uh, so I could. Chris, I think answered one of them right now. But yes, please contact me if you're interested. Uh, we recently started a photo labeling, mostly right now, just with a few students. Um, photo going through some of the 2016, 16 and 17 photos, so ones that haven't been classified. We have. Uh, probably over a hundred thousand photos to, to classify, um, but luckily a lot of those are grass, so we don't have to do that. So if you are interested, uh, please contact me. We are possibly considering opening it up, maybe non-students, but right now we're just testing it with a, a few students, who I think some of them might be on this call. So that's that's really great. Um, 
And it's, it's been going really well. We just use a Google Sheet and a Google Drive. So, so pretty basic, um, pretty basic stuff. Um, and people can do it from home. So yeah, but we're, we're still working on that. So please email me. And I've been uh, working to upload stuff as, as quickly as my, my internet speed will allow me. Um, but if there's a huge interest, I'll, I'll push more and upload more uh, to our I, uh, I will be shared emailing. Site. I will be emailing all of you and give you Ben's email, and then you'll get that through through me. And other things that Ben might and Steve and Chris might want to share with you that they weren't able to to do today. I'm going to unmute all of you so that if you want to talk, uh, you have a little bit more freedom. And uh, I also want to quickly note that. Um, Recently, we've made some YouTube videos that show some of our camera trap uh, photos, kind of like the one that we saw today. Uh, there's some other ones that are looking at different things. So if you, you want to see some some fun videos, uh, we'll be releasing those. Oh. Of course, Ted. What's going on? What's okay? I've unmuted everybody, Ben. That's why you're hearing the background noise. Oh. <laughs> um, oh, okay. So I can, I, that's, that's Judy's. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so so stay tuned. We'll post some more of those on Facebook. Those are just kind of fun videos to get you seeing different pieces of the camera traps, how, how things are going. And uh, uh, camera traps are about the fun side of things too, not just the data, but there's the photos, the wildlife, kind of connecting to the wildlife. I think that's one of the best parts of it. Um, sorry. Hopefully I didn't see any more questions. No, they're fine. I think that was all the questions that I can see. Um, I thought I might leave here at noon. Yeah. So there were might be matchers. I'll see you on the okay. Well, I guess that was a mistake. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I just I muted a few people, um, or I muted the where the noise was coming from. Uh, does anyone else have um, questions or? I, I actually had a quick question, Julie here, if you don't mind. Um, I don't know exactly who this question might be directed to, maybe Stephen or or Ben or Chris. Um, the wildlife cameras, are they placed on on trails, existing trails normally, or not? Uh, I, I can share a little bit about what I do. Um, sure. For our project, our project, we've uh, established a grid and we laid it out over the landscape. It's a one kilometer grid. Um, we kind of moved it out around so we'd get equal representation of all the different vegetation communities. Uh, and so there's actually a GPS point that's established, a Latin long. And that's where we set the, the, the wooden stake uh, and then put a, a camera on it. However, there is uh, like a 100 meter variance. Uh, so we can use some liberty in, in where we can move that cam around. And certainly if we see a trail or, or, or a sign or scat, uh, we can set a camera up in, in that particular area. So there, there is some targeting done um, for that. I see. Yeah, and if you have a small, like our camera sizes, um, our network is smaller. And it was really to compare what we see in the right of way with other locations. So uh, we basically just picked where we wanted the cameras. So we deliberately set some on trails and then deliberately set some in similar habitat types. So, so ours is a little more directed than having a grid, but it really depends on your question. But I guess the answer is yes, it can be trails and everything. Julie, and, did you mean particularly, uh, were you talking particularly about the Osborne Preserve and whether there were cameras on those trails? Okay. And um, I just also want to note that there's a fair number of other well, camera trap projects. Preserves. I'm just wondering also. because um, at Osborne, um, we have evidence of the. <laughs> You're cutting um, out. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, okay. I can't hear you, Julie. Uh, Julie, you're cutting out. Oh, I, I, um, I, it sounds like there's a, um, a kind of a calculated approach in, in spreading out the wildlife cameras um, uh, for, you know, based on habitat types and, um, you know, equal distribution. And then there's also some, some targeting in specific locations based on evidence of the animals that you may see. So, yes, that answered my question. I guess, you know, I guess different preserves are doing things differently. Some are using a mix of both approaches, it sounds like. Correct? Yeah, yeah. I, I actually, 
I actually have cameras set up in addition to the wildlife picture index where I do target areas uh, where we're wanting to know what's going on. So we have kind of both of those things going on at Pepperwood as, as well as video. And uh, it's also interesting I to note that. Uh, oh, sorry. oh, no, go ahead. Uh, some then. that trails, a lot of animals use trails. So there might be a kind of a, a misperception. Oh, they're trails, they're human structures, they're not going to use them. But, but trails provide uh, easier access in a lot of ways. And even though there might be some evidence of, of humans on those trails that, that could deter some animals, they also are much easier to use than <laughs> crawling through shrub, um, kind of like how animals use. Uh, river dried out riverbeds as well. So there's it's kind of a um, placing them on trails isn't going to limit the number of animals. You still get quite a bit, and it's, it's a really cool, interesting pattern that you see. I see, and um, just to kind of uh, follow up with with that question, um, similar. The, um, and I appreciate all the work you put into those graphs, Ben. You know, in terms of the uh, different species and uh, you know time frame in which they're active throughout the year. Do, uh, I guess I should ask this to Stephen or, or Ben or Chris, do you guys individually um, determine different individual, individual animals or is it just the species? I know Stephen mentioned, you know, the bear with the scar and, you know, so there's certain individuals that you can ID, but, but the goal isn't to ID specific individuals, is it Stephen or Ben or Chris? No, it's, that's, uh, that's incredibly difficult. <laughs> okay. It's very difficult. So with, um, one kind of interesting example is we did see a mountain lion that had a collar. Uh, this was in some of our new data that hasn't really been added into some stuff that students are looking at right now. But um, you would have to, like with that that tiger study that I talked about, they I think they had to use some kind of image processing type stuff. And and um, like there's bobcat spots, other spotted animals. You're using some kind of advanced thing to advance um, processing work to, to identify individuals. Um, I've only read a few papers on that kind of stuff and it, it's very difficult. Although like, although to follow up on that, you know, we're looking at populations, but you know, Steve mentioned he was able to follow a specific um, individual. And I know that uh, down in the Marin um, water district, they've actually had a paper out where they follow a specific mountain lion because she was identifiable. Right. And so there are, it's funny because following a specific individual grabs everybody's attention more, you know, and it makes a really good story and it's interesting. Um, but really tracking the numbers of animals and, and what they're doing um, in some ways is the more, I don't know, the more statistical, scientific, you know, looking at what's happening to an ecosystem approach. But I think both are valuable. We have any other questions? Otherwise, I think we'll let our speakers go. Nope, that's it. I don't hear anyone else coming forth. So thank you to Ben, Steve, and Christopher again. I uh, really appreciate your putting in all the work on this presentation. And thank you all for coming. And you'll be hearing from me in the next week or so with any follow-up information that our speakers want to share and make sure that you have contact information and maybe some of the references that they gave us of information that you can uh, look at. So thank you all.